Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be investigating the principle of transmissibility, a topic from statics and structural analysis that allows us to move a force anywhere along its line of action. We will be investigating its definition as well as its applicability to various two-dimensional systems in static equilibrium. So the topic for today is the principle of transmissibility. Now we will be looking at a numerical example later, but first let's just consider it in terms of uh, basic qualitative definitions. So the principle of transmissibility. Now let's say you have a rigid body, and I'm just going to draw kind of a potato body here, just to indicate that we have a uh, an object and its shape is largely irrelevant. And I'm going to look. I'm going to be looking at this from the two-dimensional perspective, but uh, the same does of course apply in three dimensions. So let's say we have a rigid body, and it has some sort of shape, an arbitrary shape, with some sort of uh, center of mass. And in terms of review, when I say rigid body, what does this mean? Uh, a rigid body, again, as a, and when I say again, I mean a review from statics. A rigid body is one that does not deform, deflect, bend, etc. Uh, does not, def and I'll just say does not, oh, deform, uh, deflect, bend, twist, etc. in any way. In other words, if you were to model this, for example, if you were to consider this from the point of view of material properties, a true rigid body would have, for example, perhaps a modulus elasticity that is infinite. And this is another engineering model that we use when analyzing certain types of structures, especially statically determinate structures. And of course, there is no such, there, there can never be any such thing as a true rigid body because it requires materials of infinite uh, strength and stiffness. But uh, at least when, if you're taking it to its logical conclusions. But we find that for many systems, approximating them as a rigid body is, a, is useful for the sake of structural analysis uh, methods. But anyway, that's near here or there. Let's look at the principle of transmissibility. What does this mean? So we have our lovely potato body here. And let's say we have a force applied. And I'll just call this some arbitrary force F. And so this force has both a magnitude and, and a direction. Force is a vector quantity, so it will have both a magnitude and a direction. And we refer to its direction as its line of action. So I can, the principle of transmissibility states that I can move this force anywhere along its line of action without changing the rigid body behavior of the object that it's acting on. And what do I mean by rigid body behavior? Well, oh, let me get a different color here. Let's say this object is restrained by a few forces. Some of y'all call this like reaction one, reaction two, squared, a reaction two, and maybe reaction three. So if this thing is going to remain in static equilibrium, there has to be some restraining forces or reactions keeping it from moving. This isn't uh, structural dynamics. This is a structural analysis course, so we're going to be looking at cases of objects and frames that are in equilibrium. So if an object is going to have forces applied to it and it's not going to move, it has to have some number of reaction forces. And so what do I mean when I say it's rigid body behavior won't change? Again, I can move F, I can move force F anywhere along its line of action. In other words, I can model it as here, I can model it as here, or I can model it as here. And no matter where I place it along its line of action, regardless of where F is along its line, Uh, along its line of action. Regardless of where I move it along its line of action, my restraint forces will remain unchanged. In other words, R1, R2, and R3 are unchanged. Now again, this will only remain true as long as we are in perfect rigid body equilibrium, or as long as we demonstrate uh, perfect rigid body behavior. But again, um, 
for real objects that aren't infinitely infinitely rigid, infinitely stiff, etc., this does hold true to a reasonable degree of accuracy. But uh, and we'll, and the reason this is useful in particular is that there are some points. Okay, so backing up, why would this be useful? So this is the principle that's fine. If we move a force anywhere along its line of action, the restraining forces required the forces required to keep it restrained will not change. But why is this important? It's important because there are some locations in terms of static analysis, balance of forces, balance of moments, etc., that are more convenient for us, especially in terms of, say, calculating moment arms. That's where it's particularly useful, because there are some locations on a, on a body or a frame that if you take the, if you try to take the moment, you'd have to do either a complicated cross product or you'd have to do some interesting trigonometry. And there are other locations that are much easier to calculate moments uh, on them, if you can move, uh, if you can move, so, and if you can move a force along that line of action, you'll have a much more time calculating balance of moments, as we'll look in our example here. All right, now that we have explored the definition of the principle of transmissibility, let's see for a moment how we would actually apply this. So let's take a look at a an, at an example, uh, really just a basic statics example intended to demonstrate the benefits of the principle of transmissibility. So transmissibility example. And I'm just going to use the example, uh, an example of just a simple, oh, a simple rectangular, simply supported frame. And so we have, let's on this, on this side, we're going to have, oh, just a roller support. And on this side, we're going to have a pin support. Okay, I'll go ahead and put on some dimensions here. So let's say this thing is 12 feet by 10 feet. So it's going to be 12 feet high and 10 feet wide, like so. And I'm going to go ahead and name a few points. Uh, I'm just going to name them fairly simply. A, B, uh, C, and D. Fairly straightforward. Now, I'm going to apply a few external loads to this structure. And I'm going to just apply, for now, I'm just going to apply simple uh, vertical and horizontal loads. Let's apply a 12 kip horizontal load and a 15 kip vertical load. So I have a downward load of 15 kips uh, on uh, joint B and a horizontal load of 12 kips on joint A. Now I'm going to go ahead and apply. Oh, oh and actually, uh, so all of the, so let's just say all of this is given. And what I want to find. Uh, that is a, a terrible F, bad writing even for me. Anyway. Uh, let's find all the reactions. Let's find all the reactions on this frame. So let's do that. So solution. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply what we've discussed previously and what you would have learned, hopefully, in statics, and go ahead and label some of the basic uh, dimensions on this frame, or not dimensions, uh, reactions on this frame. We have a roller support and a pin support, and at the roller support, we're going to have a single vertical reaction, which I'll just go ahead and call uh, C sub Y. Uh, C because it's on joint C, Y because it's on the uh, ver in the vertical direction. And generally how I handle my reactions is I simply assume, uh, I generally just simply assume all my reactions are uh, to the right and upward, and then if I get a negative, I just know they're pointed in the opposite direction. Okay, D then. Uh, it is a uh, pin support, so I'm going to have a horizontal reaction dx and a vertical reaction dy. So our goal, uh, and we'll, this problem will be considered solved when we get when we determine mathematically cy, dx, and dy. Okay. Now, this is where the pr and there's the reason I'm using this particular example again is because it is a good example of. Um, how we can apply the principle of transmissibility in order to, uh, really, in, towards our advantage. Uh, there are certain times that we can sum forces or balance moments, especially balancing moments at particular locations that give us some sort of advantage. 
So what I mean by that is uh, consider something like, uh, for example, what if I were to take a balance of moments about A? If I did a balance of moments about A, what would happen is I would have, um, okay, let's think back to basic statics and mechanics. If you take the moment of a force, or if you take, if you want to determine the moment, a force generates about a point. So if I take a, mo a, a moment about point A, for example, both dy and dx are going to uh, generate some non-zero moment about point A. But, uh, dx has a moment arm of 12 feet, and dy has a moment arm of 10 feet. And so I'm not going to have any, um, I'm going to have to do some, uh, oh, I'm going to have to, do, have to do some simultaneous, uh, solving of simultaneous linear equations, which is not the worst thing in the world, and I can do it if I need to. But at the end of the day, I'm incredibly lazy. And if I can do something without having to, uh, if I can get a solution without having to do a lot of uh, complicated or even solving uh, simultaneous equations at all, I'm going to do that. And so let's take a look at this. What happens if I solve, or if I try to determine, the sum of moments about point C? So again, remember the principle of transmissibility. I can move a, uh, I can move a force anywhere it's along its line of action, and its effect on rigid body equilibrium will remain unchanged. So that means, I, for example, I can project point, I can uh, project uh, load D backward or reaction DX backward, and I can see that it has an effective moment arm if I look along its line of action. If I look at a point C is along DX's line of action, and it has that minimum lever arm distance of zero feet, or zero meters, or whatever it might be. And so therefore, dx is ultimately going to generate no moment about point C. Cy is the same, although I don't have to do that kind of uh, principle of transmissibility. Um, I can see that Cy po uh, points directly through point C. So if uh, again, if you ever have a force that passes through a point, then it will generate no moment about that point. So if I do a summation of moments, and I'll go ahead and write all this out, and again, the principle of transmissibility is really useful, especially for finding the uh, minimum moment arm distance about a point. You can just project a force back along its line of action and then find a minimum distance. So if I wanted to find, uh, for example, if I wanted to find the moment generated by CY about point B, I could project this upward and say that the minimum moment arm length is 10 feet and use that as my moment arm distance. Alternatively, if I wanted to just, uh, let's look at the uh, alternative. Again, let's say I wanted to find the moment of CY about point B. Well, I would ha if I left the force where it was and didn't use the principle of transmissibility, I would have to find this vector here, some vector R, probably vector R, B, C or something and then find some angles and do some cross products and run, or, or run through the trigonometry and solve for that. And again, that's something you learn how to do in mechanics. That's not the worst thing in the world. But as I mentioned, I am incredibly lazy. And if I can do something without doing a lot of ma uh, complicated math, I'm going to do that. If I can avoid, a, if there is any opportunity to avoid a cross product, I'm going to take it. So um, CY times a moment arm length of zero feet Again, because the minimum moment arm length of force CY uh, about point C, the minimum moment arm length is zero feet. Uh, plus dy, let's get this out of the way, um, plus dy, and dy's minimum moment arm length, again, not the maximum or not just any moment arm length, the minimum moment arm length, which I can apply based on the principle of transmissibility, is 10 feet. And I knew it was positive about point C because it's generating a, a counterclockwise moment about point C. Uh, then I can say, okay, uh, plus dx. dx, its line of action passes through point C. And if I want to find the minimum moment arm, I can simply move dx back along its line of action, applying the principle of transmissibility. So times zero feet. Uh, and then I need to consider the external forces. So I'll have, uh, let's say, 12 feet. And again, about point C, it's going to generate a clockwise moment about point C. So that is a negative moment. <clears throat> so I'll have minus 12 kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet. Again, I'm simply, uh, well, actually, it's already applied at the point of, uh, 
uh, in this drawing, it's actually applied at the distance, the minimum distance from the moment arm, so I don't actually have to move it using the principle of transmissibility. And then this one here, though, our 15 feet, our 15 kip force, that uh, I do need to apply the principle of transmissibility to find the minimum moment arm length, which is 10 feet. Again, there's no reason I couldn't actually just mathematically find a vector from here, from C to B, and run a cross product. I absolutely could do that. But again, if there is some way I can avoid taking a cross product, I'm going to do it. And I can apply the principle of transmissibility, move it to the place that has the minimum moment arm, and then uh, simply use that moment arm when calculating the moment about point C. So, and uh, in terms of sine, this is going to be a, a clockwise moment, so that means it's going to be a negative moment. And so minus 15 kips times 10 feet times the moment arm length of 10 feet. And this is in static equilibrium. This is not dynamics class. Uh, this is in static equilibrium, so it equals zero. And if you multiply all that out, that goes away, that goes away. <clears throat> uh, and if you solve for, actually, no, that one doesn't go away. The other force D goes away. Helps if I cancel the right one out. That one goes away. And if you go and solve for dy, assuming I did the math correctly, I get that dy is equal to 29.4 kips. So dy equals 29.4 kips. And then I could do the same thing of summation of moments about point D. And I usually just write this as, how I tend to write these is like the summation of moments counterclockwise positive. That's what the summation means. Well, in particular, this means the summation of moments about point D, sum, sum, uh, sigma symbol for summation, capital M for moment, uh, D for the point that I'm taking at, and then uh, counterclockwise positive with this notation. So summation of moments about point D and uh, DX and DY will have no moment arm because they pass directly through point D. Uh, CY will generate a moment there. So, and then um, looking at the 12 kip force, first look, let's look at that 12 kip force, minus 12 kips. It's already at its location of minimum moment arm, so I don't need to move it anywhere along its line of action. So my, and I know it's negative, again, because it is clockwise, it's generating a clockwise moment about point C. So moment arm length of 12 feet. Uh, this 15 kip force will have a minimum, if I, and again, here I'm going to have to apply the principle of transmissibility, and if I move it down along its line of action, I can see that the, that the force, uh, this 15 kip force, has a minimum moment arm distance of 10 feet. And again, this one will be negative because it is moving clockwise about point C. So minus 15 kips uh, times moment arm length of 10 feet. Then I'll, I could say uh, both DX and DY will generate no moment about point D uh, because they pass directly through point D. Therefore, they have no moment arm plus DX times zero feet plus dy times zero feet, just again considering the moment arms. And then finally, uh, let's say uh, we will have minus cy. And in terms, so uh, cy is already at its location of minimum moment arm length about point d. It's directly perpendicular. It, again, I could, take its, uh, I could take its moment about somewhere up here. I mean, there's no reason mathematically I couldn't move it up here if I wanted to. Uh, cy I'm talking about again. There's no reason I couldn't move CY vertically along this line of action if I really wanted to, but there's no practical reason to do that. It's already at its location where it's most convenient to take moments about point D. So, and then um, in terms of CY, it's generating a clockwise moment about point D, and clockwise moments are negative, so there'll be a minus sign on this. Minus CY times moment arm length of 10 feet. And because this is uh, this is structural analysis, we're looking at static equilibrium. Uh, this will equal zero because we are not accelerating in any way. And if I ran through the algebra correctly and canceled things out, I got that cy is equal to negative fourteen point four, negative fourteen point four kips. And then um, finally, I want to get dx. That's the only remaining. Um, that is the only remaining reaction. And I'm just going to do, for this one, I could do a balance of moments, so I'm just going to do a simple summation of forces in the x direction to the right positive. And I'll have 12 kips. That's the external force 12 kips plus dx. And this, of course, has to equal 0 because we're in static equilibrium. 
And then solving for that, of course, then you just get that dx is equal to negative 12 kips, which would mean 12 kips to the left in this case. So we have our reactions. This will have a uh, dy will have a vertical reaction of 29.4 kips. Uh, Cy will have a uh, downward reaction of negative 14.4 kips, downward like this. And uh, dx will have a horizontal force to the left of 12 kips. And that is one example of how you can apply the principle of transmissibility uh, to readily solve for the reactions of um, structures in static equilibrium. Again, the entire idea is that um, there are many, there are different cases where it might be useful to apply the principle of transmissibility, but in terms of structural analysis, especially 2D structural analysis, often the most convenient is where you're going to move a force um, to the location of minimum moment arm. And, re and uh, the reason that's important or useful is that often if you pick a point where, where all but one unknowns cancel out, you can very quickly solve for a single unknown. So the best, so when dealing with 2D frames and in static equilibrium, especially deterministic, statically determinate frames, often the best place to take moments is at a location where all of your unknowns except one have zero moment arm. That's the ideal case. If you can do that, you're golden because you can just very directly solve for a single unknown. If you, if you have to have an equation with two unknowns, then you're going to need two different equations to solve for that, and then you're going to have to solve for then you're going to have to solve simultaneous equations. If you have three unknowns, like if you just do, if you have three vertical forces, for example, and you do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, then you'll have three unknowns, and you have to come up with uh, you will have to use three total equations in order to solve that. You have to solve three simultaneous equations, which means you're going to have to whip out a matrix, which <laughs> we will do later in this course. But for now, uh, I like to keep things simple, and that is something the principle of transmissibility uh, really helps with. All right, I hope you found this useful, a uh, little eye-opening or uh, informative. If you did, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and leave uh, comments below. Uh, I'll see you all again soon, and as always, thank you.